Hi, this is Bob Minner, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who plays bluegrass. My guest on Bluegrass Jam Along today is Bob Minner. A lot of you will know Bob as Tim McGraw's guitarist, which he's been for almost 30 years now. Um, a lot of you will know Bob from the front porch videos he posts on YouTube, beautiful acoustic guitar playing, um, loads of great tunes and songs on there. Check them out if you haven't seen them. Um, I know Bob initially because he's the admin of a Facebook guitar group, Bluegrass Guitar Group, that I joined a year or so ago. Um, and yeah, just got to sort of know Bob's playing and know Bob through that. So whichever way you know Bob, Bob's here with us today to talk about a really special project. Um, and it is a tribute to Norman Blake. Uh, the record's called From Sulphur Springs to Rising Fall and the Songs of Norman Blake and contains a load of great pickers, a load of great tunes, and there's a lot of great um, chat to be had about how this came about, I think. So, Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it, Matt. It's really cool. It's, it's, such, a great, um, it's such a great thing, uh, and I'd love to just sort of kick off with, with how it came about, really. So sure. why, why Norman and why now? Well, um, when I was 12 years old, um, I don't remember how I got the money, but I had enough money to buy a cheap Bentley guitar, acoustic guitar, um, and I bought my first Norman Blake album, which was the Whiskey Before Breakfast album. And I guess the reason that kind of resonated with me is because the original album had a sticker on it that said Norman Blake's guitar album. You know, but prior to that, my dad was already involved with... Uh, he had a bunch of vinyl in the house of, um, of course, Will the Circle Be Unbroken album, a bunch of string band, uh, claw hammer, uh, banjo kind of music. So that was already in the house, you know. So anyway, uh, and he took me to see Doc Watson when I was like five or six, but I don't really kind of recall a whole lot about that, you know. Um, okay. So anyway, I bought this album, this guitar, and that kind of started the whole journey with the whole Norman Blake thing. So, uh, you know, through the years, Norman's guitar playing, songwriting, of course, everything, and Nancy as well, you know, um, that, that whole package, it just kind of followed me through my whole life, you know, and of course, we moved to Nashville, um, and I've been with Tim playing acoustic for him for 30 years this year, which is wow. it's a long time to have a job anywhere, I guess, much less in the music business, yeah. and um, so... Uh, George Gruen lives up here by me. We're, we're, we're neighbors. And I was at his shop, Latin, in fact, February of last year, uh, and just talking. He's showing me some of the great new stuff they've got in, uh, stuff I'll never be able to afford. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so uh, one thing led to another. And I was talking to him, and I said, you know, I want to do a, a, another, a solo project, just various tunes, some maybe some fiddle tunes, maybe some songs that I've written, uh, lyrically, I said, there's a Norman Blake song that I've always wanted to redo called Lonesome Jenny. I said, it has a huge cello part that Nancy plays on it. I said, well, I don't know any cello players. I'm sure they're in Nashville, but they're kind of maybe, you know, hard to come by. So George, in his usual way, says, well, why don't we just call Norman and Nancy? And he pulls out a cell phone. And in a matter of seconds, there's Norman and Nancy on speakerphone. And I'm just totally freaked out because there's, you know, there's the voice. And had you so, met them before? Or... Oh, oh no, you... never, never. And I, it's, it's kind of funny. I had someone give me Norman's P.O. box in Rising Fawn. And I had thought about writing a letter and I'm like, nah, he's not going to answer. You know, he's Norman Blake. And who am I? So... I never contacted him, never met him, just a huge fan. So anyway, I, I, after that phone call with Norman and Nancy at George's shop, uh, I just kind of kept in contact. And then Kenny Smith and I, Kenny lives right up the road from me in Lebanon, Missouri. I mean, Tennessee, rather. Uh, me and Kenny called Norman on his birthday last year because Kenny's a huge Norman Blake fan as well. And so I just kind of kept in contact. And it was probably towards the end of March or sometime in April that I told my wife, I said, you know, as much as I'd like to do another project for myself, with Tony Rice passing in December before, 
which left a huge void. Huge void. And I expected yeah. kind of a plethora of Tony Rice tribute albums to come out. So, you know, it's the old joke. Who do you get to play guitar on a Tony Rice tribute album? You know, who wants that job? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I, I told my wife, I said, I know enough people, uh, written songs with a number of them, and I know enough other guys who are great players. I think I want to do a Norman and Nancy tribute album and sort of kind of give props and give them their flowers while they're still here, you know, as opposed to yeah. waiting, you know, which sometimes people often do. And so, uh, Englehart music group is ran by a guy named Adam Englehart. And I've known Adam for years and Adam takes care of all the, the administration of my songwriting catalog. But he also has a lot of successful bluegrass acts. Uh, Tina Adair, Fast Track, um, and, and Eddie Sanders, and a whole bunch of others. So I told Adam, I said, here's my idea. I want to do a Norman Blake tribute album and have a special guest come in. What, what do you think? He says, well, you know, take some time, get songs together, get the artists you'd like to have on them, and uh, bring it to me. And when I showed him everything, it was kind of a no-brainer. So that was really kind of whole, how the whole process started because George Gruen decided to take out his cell phone and call, call Norman Blake. So that's how it started. And that's a great start to any story, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I think it's a beautiful right. thing because I, I spoke to Chris Eldridge a couple of months ago for the podcast and he was talking about yeah. uh, Punch, Punch Brothers Church Street Blues sort of tribute. Um, sure. And he was, he was saying, you know, he thought about calling Tony because he was recorded before Tony died and they were, you know, but sure. he, he decided that he just wanted to present it to him and say, Here, here's this thing we made mm -hmm. because we love you. And he never got the chance. So there's something yeah. beautiful about being able to do that for somebody who can receive the gift. You know, it's, it's yeah, it really is. Thing. And of course, you know, Chris played on one of the cuts on the album. Uh, the, the fitting song for Chris would have uh, obviously what is, is Ridge road gravel because of his connection to Tony. Mm. And when I called him up, I said, "Hey, you know, this is what I'm. This is what I like to do. Would you be interested?" And of course, a resounding yes. You know, and that was one of the things. Everybody who performed on the record had to be a, a Norman fan. Uh, so when when Chris decided, you know, yeah, I'd love to do that with you, I, I called Norman. And that was the other thing with this project is that, as opposed to doing the project and then just, you know, handing it off to Norman and Nancy saying. Here's a tribute project. I took the time to develop um, a relationship with both of them and then also involve him in a lot of things with like um, song choice. You know, what did he think about this? Letting them know how we're going to approach the tunes, uh, even down mm -hmm. to the artwork on the, on the cover of the album, which is a bridge that is no longer existent. Uh, it's a bridge and rising fawn. And in fact, last week, Norman, uh, I was talking to Norman and, and he says, you're not going to believe this. He says, I just found out that my, my grandfather, his grandfather, Larkin actually helped build that bridge. You know, That's so right. it's like, you know, how, how does that happen? <laughs> so involving him in the process. And of course, Nancy too, because I included two of her mandolin songs, mm. um, it, it was just kind of a richer experience that way. So when it came to Chris Eldridge, I called him and said, Hey, we're doing Ridge road gravel. Um, the only time that's ever been cut by you is with Tony. Norman never cut it on any of his records. And I said, you know, we don't want to make it like a Blake and rice album. You know, we want to make it our own thing, but we might overlap because you know it's Chris Eldridge and I'm doing the Norman thing. And he says, and he says this, he says, well, you guys go ahead and do it how you want. He says, but be sure on the record to dedicate it to Tony because he was a friend of mine too. And that really touched me, you know? So, yeah. uh, yeah, you know, it was nice to include Chris in that because obviously the, the Blake and Rice albums one and two, they're, they're timeless, you know, and they will yeah. be a hundred years from now for guitar players. So, yeah. 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 And which, which sort of came first, the tunes or the personnel? Did you sort of pick some tunes and then pick the people that you felt 
work best that way or did you yeah. have a bunch of people you wanted to work with well you know part of the thing with doing any kind of album uh, a tribute album with anyone who has such a huge catalog like norman and nancy you're only going to scratch the surface on, on any project yeah. and so part of what the struggle was is okay a lot of these songs mean a lot to me because I they made impressions on me early on um, so it's like how do you include include the ones that are maybe obscure like Lonesome Jenny's obscure uh, Widow's Creek I did with Kenny Smith that's an instrumental that's that's obscure uh, what's another obscure one? Um, well, it hey, Hanging Dog is kind of semi-well-known for Mandolin, from Nancy. Uh, but it's like, how do you include songs that are kind of a little obscure and then include things, I guess if you want to call them hits, <laughs> the popular yeah. ones like Ridge Road yeah. Gravel, Ginseng Sullivan, Church Street Blues, because you have to include those as well. So I just kind of jotted down you know list number one list number two and just kind of kept weeding it down and kind of going okay this kind of makes sense and when it came to people most of the time i already had in my mind who i wanted to to i, I could hear them singing the song and i only had yeah. a couple of scheduling conflicts you know from the original list uh but mostly it was like like the lonesome jenny song Norman's version is just him and Nancy, and it's well over six minutes long. I thought it would be nice to have Dale Ann Bradley bring what she does. You know, she's a great mountain bluegrass singer and really is a great lyrical interpreter. So I called her, you know, she did that, and we put on a string section with that, too, a three-piece string section, a violin, a viola, and a cello, which... Normally, you would never equate with Dale Ann Bradley, you know, but it works. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of it was just, I heard, the, I heard the singing in my head, and it just made sense. And like I said, with the exception of a couple of scheduling conflicts, I got everybody that, that, that I really wanted. Um, I'm pretty proud of the results. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of got hold of a... Uh, they set the tracks yesterday and started listening and it's yeah. just it's beautiful i mean it's it's very um it's very intimate it feels like being in a room yeah. with a couple of people telling you a story yeah. you know it's uh it's, right. a, it's a really sort of close sound yeah that was part of the uh that was part of the the whole focus too is you know uh norman and nancy everything they did was just either them or maybe with james bryan for the rising fawn string ensemble uh uh, Norman's uh, mandolin record obviously had more people on it. But by and large, they produced the music in a very duo type of way. And so that was kind of important to kind of keep that whole vibe, um, especially when you're when you're taking these songs and it's like, how do I approach these songs to kind of Make them recognizable, but make them different. You know, yeah. not do them like everybody else. And certainly, you know, sometimes you're going to succeed at that. Sometimes you're going to fail in certain areas because the songs really are timeless. Like the first release, Ginseng Sullivan with Ron Block. Ron brought that arrangement to it and the chords and the way he does it. And I think what he and I did is decidedly different than what most people think Jensen Sullivan is. And yet it still keeps, because it's just the two of us, like with every other cut on the record, it keeps the spirit of Norman and Nancy with what they did. So I think that was what made, made the whole project work. Uh, keep it duo, you know, situation. I think the only trio I've got is, is uh, on and on and on with Jeremy Stevens and, and his wife, Karina Rose. Other than that, it's me and somebody else whether it's instrumental or vocal. And the other thing that we did is instead of really, you know, browbeating arrangements to death, I just basically let people bring what they wanted to bring to the song. I mean, you know, 
I had some input once we got there in the studio, but it's like, come in, this is the song you're going to do. You know, they, they knew what they were going to do. So they brought the lyric in. And I basically said, okay, so what do you think? What do you got? And that's really kind of how the, the record came about. It's quick arrangements, quick production. There's some string noise. You can hear some finger yeah. noise, some string noise. And hear some, you know, no, guitar noise. Um, and Norman says, he says, you know, it's not a real record if that stuff's not in it. <laughs> so, yeah, I love about that. Yeah. I yeah. love it. I, you so know, that, just a, no, no, go ahead. No, it's a, just that, that intimacy that the record has as a result. And it's always that forecasting thing. You know, this record was recorded because of scheduling with people. Yeah. Um, it was maybe two people a day. Maybe and and it was spread out over a number of months, you know, due due to scheduling, and so there's that thing. Well, at least with me, maybe you know that worry if you get you know six or seven tunes in, then you get ten tunes in, and so on, and so on. And it's like, what is this going to sound like when you string it all together and you know put it in the yeah. right order that you want the songs? So there was a little trepidation with me on the backside of that, but. I think the end result is a is a really intimate listening experience, and it's like you told me um, on the message. It's almost like being in the room, and that's a great compliment, you know. And uh, and I actually went down and played it for Norman and Nancy, which is that was a that was a lesson in trying to keep you cool, you know. But I wanted them <laughs> to hear it. Did you manage you know? it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we went down. After I got all the tracks done and got it ma got it mastered, um, uh, and I, I had been telling Norman and Nancy, you know, look, you know, I don't want any surprises. You know, I'd like for you to hear this, and uh, and, and going to their house and rising fall, it's it, it's kind of like going to Oz. You know, it's kind of like Wizard of Oz. It's like this place that is. It's like when you pull up to the drive. You know, once you find the place, because they're so far away, they're so buried into the hills. Once you find it, and you get in there, it's almost like time stops. And and I and I know that sounds corny, but it but it really kind of does because you know now you're on their turf, you know. Mm. Um, and I wanted to play the record for them, and so he says, "Yeah, sure, come on down." And so I brought it was me and my wife Ginger. And we brought George Gruen with us, too, because George and Nancy and Norman had been friends forever, you know, since the late 60s. Um, so I took a pair of studio monitors, powered studio monitors, and my phone, and I ran the cables and everything, and set it up in one of the rooms of the house. And, and then Nancy starts putting out chairs, sitting chairs, you know, like maybe, you know, eight to ten feet back from there. So it's, I'm, I'm like, okay, this is either an audition or a firing squad. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was Ginger and me and, and Norman and Nancy, George, and then uh, Joel McCormick. Joel is a is a dear friend of the Blakes. Uh, he's also the judge in that in that county. Uh, and he's a great musician as well. He's done a lot of stuff with Norman. Uh, if you see the Songbird videos from the museum, uh, that's Joel playing guitar. So anyway, um, just played the record for them, and and, uh, and they didn't have to because I think they're they're pretty honest people. You know what what you see is what you get with them. They were really touched by the album and really appreciative and gave it high marks, which meant everything to me. You know, it's like, mm. even if I don't, even if I don't sell, but a few, <laughs> man, you know, I got Norman and Nancy's approval on it. And so, um, yeah, so that was that experience. And so at least I jumped the hurdle with that. They like it. Yeah. And I hope everybody else does too. You know, And they I were nice enough to write like, they were nice enough to write liner notes for the record, which, it, which means a lot to me too. And those are two pieces of paper that I'll always, I'll always cherish. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to like this. I don't think it's going to sell just a few copies. I think it's, uh, I think it's the kind of like regardless of the the sort of story and the intent behind it, which is a, a wonderful thing in its own right. Mm -hmm. But it's still got to be a good record, and it is, um, and it stands on either of those feet firmly, and Thank thankfully you. stands on them both at the same time. 
Um, it's Thanks. yeah, I think it's 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 really cool. And with that, you're sort of talking about the slight trepidation about sort of putting all the pieces together. How how was it recorded? Was the continuity in terms of the room and the the setting, or was it done in various places? Mm-hmm. Well, um, again, because of scheduling conflicts and and of course the pandemic. You know, that was part of the issue, too. Um, Adam Englehart is a studio manager of Sony Music, <clears throat> so uh, which is a world-class studio. Uh, we, we got a number of tracks done there, uh, but due to the pandemic and pandemic restrictions and COVID restrictions, and then, of course, them doing a lot of revamping and construction we had to record at some other places. Now, like Jensen Sullivan with Ron, I drove out to Ron's house and, and recorded there, which is where he does all his solo albums. And, you know, he gets, I mean, it's great quality. And so we did that there. We also recorded uh, three or so uh, at, at Ronnie Millsap's studio, Ronnie's place in Nashville. And uh, then um, I recorded some, at um, Scott Vestal, the great banjo player, Scott yeah. Vestal's studio at his house, underground, digital underground. And so, you know, when you when you change locations, you do kind of worry about the sonic continuity. But everybody was really, I think because the record is so pared down, you know, it's not a five-piece everybody in the Kia B bluegrass album, you know, it's more intimate. Um, it's more in the moment, so to speak. Uh, I think the engineers, regardless of the location, were, were kind of more sensitive to that, you know, and of course, Adam, you know, he engineered stuff at Sony, um, along with his co-engineer, uh, uh, Tyler Pollard. And then he also did the stuff at, at Ronnie Millsap studio. So he had, he had the reins on that, you know, where he could kind of control that. But I think at the in the end, it all just kind of it flows well sonically. I don't think there's any problems with that. So, and really, you know, when you work with with individuals at that level, when with the engineers, you just kind of learn to shut up and play guitar. You, you know. <laughs> They've got you. They've got your back. Yeah, they, yeah. they know what to do, you know. And, and Adam has made enough records, and all they all have, you know. So it's like let them do what they do, and I'll just focus in on 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 this over here. And I think that's part of the reason it sounds like it does. Yeah, yeah, it definitely sounds great. Um, I think one of the things I was most struck by is, I mean, the first couple of times I listened to different tracks jumped out, but one of the things I really enjoyed was. Vince Gill singing Church Street Blues, because Church Street Blues is, yeah. you know, one of Norman's best known songs. Um, sure. And, but also extremely famous for Tony Rice's version of it, which, which oh, is yeah. sort of, uh, which is, you know, an incredible version of it, but it's sort of become a bit of a, a bit of a sort of guitar rite of passage almost. And it's become, it it's become as much about the guitar as about the vocal. I mean, Tony was an incredible singer too, but it's sort of become yeah. a guitar thing and it feels like there's a little bit of reclaiming it as a song where it's, it's not a, it's not a particularly intricate arrangement. It's just a telling right. of this story of a guy who's having a hard time feeling a bit sorry for himself. And it, it sort of brings it back mm. to the song. Um, and it's okay. compared to Norma's version and Tony's version. It adds something as another version. It's not trying to be either of those. And I think that's, quite hard to do with a song like that. I appreciate that. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, um, when Vince came in to do Church Street Blues, and it's interesting, like you said, about Tony's version and Owen's version, whether you take them on, on their records or even on video, sometimes there's slight inflections on the courting between Tony and Norman. Um, yeah. Lyrically, too, there's a few things a little different between, you know, Tony and Norman. So even in those camps, there's no one exclusive version unless you go with the very first version that Norman did. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, 
again, Vince was one of those, that was one of those songs and pairings. It was like, well, yeah, why not get Vince? And I had known Vince enough through uh, other circumstances with, with guitar deals and, or whatnot uh, that uh, I felt comfortable in asking him to do it, which was kind of funny because I, I sent him a voicemail because I don't expect him to, you know, pick up the phone you know, every time I, you know, I would call him. He's, he's, he's busy. So, like, two or three weeks go by, and then my wife and I are out grabbing a bite to eat, and then the phone comes, and Vince's number comes up, and I'm like, I got to get this. Because I thought he was just not going to, maybe, you know, he's so mm -hmm. busy, he doesn't have time for it. But he was so accommodating, and he's he's really one of those individuals that everybody's pawing at him to do something, and he's on a lot of projects. But he really does believe in adding a link to the chain and he and he he just loves people and he loves the music you know so and again you know uh vince says hey you know i've got i've got a way i hear this being done i've got the lyric i'll just show up and he shows up uh with his uh, uh his young friend jack snyder and brings out this, I think it's a 41 herringbone. Um, and we're in the control room. And I'm just following his lead. You know, what's the key? What's the arrangement? How's he want to play it? And he played it on the record and in the control room in a very Mother Maybell-esque kind of way. There's no pick. You know, he just used his fingers. And whether he realizes it or not, I think that's a nice nod back to one of Norman's influences, which is Mother Maybell. You know, Norman got mm. to spend some time with her and had a relationship with her. And and I think, you know, that was a nice hearkening back. And, you know, for me, it was like just him doing the guitar and vocal with what he did would have been enough. It's like, well, I'm just going to add something. How do you add to what's already perfect with him? And what's interesting is he recorded his guitar and vocal at the very same time. There's there's not any vocal fixing, uh, mm -hmm. all, no auto tune. You don't use that with Vince Gill. Uh, and so I think that was part of the sweetness of that track, is because you're capturing it again very live, you know. And so I think what we presented with Church Street Blues, uh, and I I, really want, I wanted to mention this earlier before I got long winded. When we cut that, I didn't know that the Punch Brothers were going to come out with their version, mm. which is in you know it's in five you know it's in five time, and and it's to me, I think that's a genius arrangement of that song. It really brings what they do and the timelessness of Norman's song. It kind of just cohesively blends it into something that is really punch brothers you know nobody else could do it like that or would think to do it like that yeah. so i appreciate your compliment that you know it's it's a it's another version that maybe doesn't sound like every other version you know so i i appreciate that it but the secret to that is vince gill he he brought it i just played guitar so <laughs> yeah, you have probably been too obvious there but um but i think that's a really kind of an interesting point about a tribute album is that if you've got a bunch of people who love those songs and those tunes, yeah, and they're they're all going to be musical personalities in their own right, like that's you, right. You have to go. You have to go. So your job as an artist is to express yourself through whatever medium and whatever right. material you choose to use. There's no mm -hmm. point trying. I mean, a like you said about Tony, who's going to be able to play them like Norman? So. <laughs> You know, yeah, and and he was like, he was unique as well. He wasn't imitating anybody else, and you've you've just got to keep adding to it and bring your own thing and and hope that people like it. Right, and you know, tribute records are kind of they're they're just a tricky thing at times. Um, and I, I what struck me, a couple of things kind of struck me funny, wanting to do this project. Number one was, why hasn't anybody done a tribute to Norman before? You would think mm. with the breadth and depth of his catalog and what him and Nancy have done, somebody would have done that by now, but, but that doesn't exist. 
And the second thing was, you know, I've always been a bluegrass guy. I've always been a, a flat picker. I've always done that. But, you know, for lack of a better phrase, you know, my claim to fame has been playing for Tim McGraw, this iconic country artist. And so on either side of the fence, there's people that know I do one thing, but not the other and vice mm -hmm. versa. And it was like to do this record. Number one, I could not have done it by myself because I'm not a singer. You know, I just I just am not. I'm, I can sing, but I wanted it to be great vocals, you know. And so it was like I needed the help to bring these songs to the table. Uh, but it was like, you know, uh, I'm a country guy over here playing for a country artist. What's he doing doing the Norman Blake tribute? Well, this is that 12-year-old me. You know, this is kind of uh, bringing these folks to the table and calling them up. It was kind of a guilty pleasure. You know, I, I kind of mentioned that in the liner notes. It's kind of indulgent. It's like, you know, man, I want to hear what some of my favorite singers and musicians sound like doing these songs. And they just, mm. you know, I just happened to get to do it on my record. So, yeah, it was kind of a dream come true. A, a guilty indulgence, so to speak. <laughs> I think a, gu a guilty indulgence that I'm very happy took place. I'm very much enjoying <laughs> it. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting point, though, talking about sort of being uh -huh. a, a country player, doing the bluegrass <laughs> projects. And like yeah. Norman Blake is not necessarily somebody who started his career as a bluegrass musician as such. I mean, I remember you saying... I think it yeah. might have been when we talked on the phone previously about doing this interview. Yeah. You, you sort of said Tony brought Norman into the bluegrass world. He was off playing with all sorts of people. He wasn't strictly a bluegrass player. Right. I, I, in one way, that could be interpreted as a blanket statement in one way. But, you know, when Norman came to Nashville, um, he had already had a reputation as a great musician in, in the Chattanooga area. And when he came to Nashville, uh, which, you know, he told me, he says, I asked him, so what guitar did you come to town with? What was your first guitar in Nashville? He says, well, I came to town with Charlie Monroe's D45. Wow. Wow. You know, and, you know, Norman quickly found work as a session guy. But then he hooked up with, with Johnny Cash. And, mm -hmm. and the story there uh, is... I, f I forget exactly how, but he, Norman went with someone to a Johnny Cash recording session. Uh, I think Mother Maybell was there, and and Mother Maybell told told Cash, "This is the guitar player. I'm, this is the musician I'm, I, I told you about, Norman Blake." And Johnny says, "Can you play dobro?" And Norman's like, "Yeah, I, I play dobro." He says, "Well, get a dobro, and I'll use you on the session tomorrow." Just like that. <laughs> And so Norman borrowed a doorbro uh, from Uncle Josh, Josh Graves. <laughs> and that started that relationship. And then, of course, he went on as as the band leader and musical director, um, uh, as far as Johnny Cash's band is concerned, with the, with the Cash show, TV show, you know. Mm. And, I had, you know, if you get the box set of the DVDs, you know, you see a lot of Norman on there as well. So he started with that, and uh, he also worked for uh, Chris Christopherson for a while. Uh, did the Isle of Wight Festival with 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 Christopherson, and then you know, so he had those roots, and, and of course, you know, Bob Dylan's Nashville Skyline album, you know, he mm. played on that also. But then he made this departure and started to fully develop, becoming Norman Blake as we know him. You know, and so we've talked about what it was like to be a side guy, you know. Um, and so to be a side guy, like with what I do, um, I don't want to say regimented, but, you know, I know my lane of traffic. This is what I do, you know. And I think that develops certain disciplines to bring to the table uh, in a lot of a lot of different ways, musically, personality wise, how to get along with people, how to travel. You know, um, how to stay out of people's hair, so to speak, you know, uh, and then, of course, you know, how to work as a band, as a group, know what you need mm -hmm. to do. 
Um, and I would say that I brought some of those things, obviously, to the project. But, you know, being a side guy for that long with the country artists here in town, you know, that's that's paid the mortgage. That's helped raise a family. But again, you know, just under that surface has always been this music that I that I really love. And I was telling someone uh, that I found it recently that it's like the I just turned 56, and it's like the older you get, if you're raised in that music, and you may take other detours, it's like you always find yourself kind of coming back to this. I don't know safe zone. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but it's. I guess it gets so ingrained in you when you're young mm -hmm. and then you go out into the world and do what you're going to do. And then you just kind of follow your way back to it, you know? So yeah, it's a bit that's like where being, I'm at with um, all that. Yeah. It's a bit like being from the country, moving to the city for a while, but moving back to sort of settle down and raise a family. It's like, you know, there's a, a homecoming element about something that's that deeply ingrained in you. Yeah. I it, think, you know, yeah, those songs and plus, you know, those songs, that no one wrote. They're just they're they're snapshots of his childhood and growing up, and um, and I was also raised in a rural environment, so you know, I guess there's there's that too. You know, I relate to him mm -hmm. in my own way with growing up in a rural environment. So yeah, and that whole sort of thing about um, playing with other people and as a side man. I mean, my first, I think my first. Um, knowledge of Norman was when he played on Steve Earle's Train of Coming album. And oh, I was wow. a big Steve Earle fan. Steve had, you know, been to sure. prison and come out and this was Absolutely. his first album back. And, uh, yeah. and I, knew, I didn't know anything about bluegrass at that point in my life. And I'm sort of listening to yeah. this and there's one, there's one track, I think it's called Northern Winds, which is just Norman playing the guitar. I mean, the liner notes just said, shut up and learn something, or, shut up and listen or something like that. And, think, oh, <laughs> yeah. and, this, and then realized it's the same guy who's also playing the Dobro on the record. And, Right. You know, just think, oh, this, you know, and then went to see Steve O play live and he said, you know, we didn't tour that record because Norman didn't want to fly. Um, yeah, I, think, oh, I need, right. to, need, need to find out more about this guy, you know, and, you know, yeah. here we are now. You know, I'm yeah, by yeah, no yeah. means an expert in Norman Blake, but I'm, I'm learning to love his music. You know, it, and that's the other thing that I, I kind of wanted to make this record for. Um, the three points that I always kind of make with this is, Number one, this record is kind of a thank you from the 12 year old me in, in, in a certain regard. And next, it's for the it's for the folks that are really familiar with Norman's music and maybe have been listening to him for maybe five years or maybe, you know, 45 years. And they mm -hmm. remember the first time they saw him in concert or or bought the vinyl. Because, uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of his stuff. Um, is is not some of the early stuff is not on CD, you know. Um, I mean, I'm sure it probably is by now, but I'm saying, you know, uh, uh, some of the stuff you just have to dig out in vinyl, you know. Mm. Uh, and so, a lot of younger people may not be familiar with it, and that's really the third point of that. Younger musicians may not really know stuff off his old and new album, or Home and Sulphur Springs, or. Um, Fields of November, but they may know Ronnie Bowman. They might know, they might be a fan of Vince or Trey Hensley or Mike Compton or whoever on the record. And they'll listen to our cuts and go, man, I really like that performance by so-and-so. And I hope they uh, get inspired and go, Hey, you know, I'm going to go find the original versions of this, you know, and, and begging the point with, with Tony, we never, you know, didn't cover that. Tony bringing Norman into bluegrass. When I said that, what I meant was Norman, you, you can't really classify what he does as, as it, it's not bluegrass. It's, mm -hmm. and I think even to kind of slip into the, the titles of Americana or folk, I think in a way that's kind of misleading in a way. I think what he and Nancy did, that's them. It's Norman and Nancy Blake music. It's, and I think the closest that you could get to that today, maybe in, in modern terms, is maybe Dave Rawlings and Gillian Welch. Hmm. You know? Yeah. I, and I, you know, as far as defining something very unique, uh, because certainly what they do is very unique. 
But, you know, when Tony started cutting uh, Norman songs, that brought that brought those things into, I think, a, a wider spectrum and, and, and a different interpretation. You know, certainly bluegrass guitar players were already aware of, of Norman Blake's guitar playing and music, yes. Mm. But I think Tony brought it into a broader a broader field, if that makes sense. That maybe not what that maybe would have not have been there had he not cut those songs. You know. So and what's I mean, what's funny is you know those songs were cut even if you go to Blake and Rice, which were like what, nineteen eighty seven and nineteen ninety that's a while ago, you know. Mm, yeah, yeah. And you think, yeah, you know, nineteen ninety. That's, you know, that that's not exactly yesterday, you know. So there's some years between. There's some years between what we kind of consider the definitive versions, you know. So I think Tony brought him in to perhaps a wider bluegrass audience, but then again. People who play bluegrass guitar and flat picking guitar, they already had Norman on on their map. You know? yeah, yeah. Just, you know, yeah. So, and the, the sort of the the wider sort of understanding and awareness of bluegrass is maybe different now than it was in the late eighties, early nineties. I just you know, like yeah. my generation lived through the Air Brother Where Art Thou thing, which you know sure. came in the same sure. sort of time as. You know, Alison Krauss and Nickel Creek, and there was you right. know, suddenly a lot of people aware of, and 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 so yeah. that probably, I presume, there was a whole resurgence in awareness of of Norman's stuff then as well, and yeah. suddenly a bigger audience for this stuff. Sure, and you know, I think the 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 appeal certainly what we consider bluegrass, and it's always been this way. It's always it's always morphing. It's always kind of changing. You have your strict traditionalists. You have your contemporary. You, have, you know, early on you had you had um, uh, newgrass revival doing things that were kind of blasphemous to the traditionalist, but that drew in um, for the good. It drew in a, a younger audience that maybe remembers. Um, Mac Wiseman or Flatten Scruggs with their mom and dad, but they're like, man, look at these hippies. They're 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 playing the same. They're playing a banjo, they're playing a mandolin, mm-hmm. but it's different. And I, you know, that's just what it's always been. But I think what really, really helped bluegrass overall was that uh, the technology end of it with with YouTube and streaming music. Um, I think as far as media access and being able to share the music, uh, that resonated with a younger type of musician. And also, you know, those younger musicians like a Chris Thiele or, or maybe a Molly Tuttle or a Billy Strings, you know, they're, they're not just bluegrass. They're bringing in influences from other genres that they, that they enjoy listening to whatever that might be. Hmm. And they're adding that to that. And, you know, we didn't really get that early on in, in the formative years of, of, of bluegrass, maybe as much as, as that. So it's always changing. It's always morphing. Um, and, and same way with guitar styles in, in that genre. Um, people want to, you know, they, they might make certain criticisms about certain players. You know, they may not like, traditionalists may not like what Billy Strings does, but I'm like, well, Billy Strings is bringing it to a wider audience than, you know, it, that's been brought to in a long time. He's doing something that other facets of bluegrass either couldn't do or wouldn't do. So, and same way with Molly, you know. And yet, Billy Strings can sit down with you and just, you know, tear Doc Watson up, you know, mm-hmm. verbatim. So it isn't like he's displaced from it. He's just bringing what he does. Um, you know, so I think that's, that has its own value. And the musicianship, that's the other thing, is just how good and how high the lovely musicianship 
in the past, you know, 15 years, 20 years with musicians, uh, there's so many younger musicians coming to the table bringing skills that, you know, when I was a teenager in the late 70s, early 80s, nobody was playing like that. You know, none of my, well, you had Mark O'Connor who came out with his guitar album, Arcology, and yeah. we're like, you know, just totally freaked out that he's doing that. That's as tough as it got. And now, that's commonplace. There's so many great players out there, you know, whether Trey Hensley or um, Aubrey King or, or Jake Workman uh, or Molly or Billy. There's so many great players out there. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's going to be any slowdown of that either. You know, and the other great thing is that they're so connected to the past, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can tell you about Flatt and Scruggs or Jimmy Martin or whatever. And so, yeah, uh, the future's bright for sure for guitar. And I think that technology point is really interesting because it works on so many levels. You know, just the like the streaming thing. When I was getting into bluegrass um, originally in the sort of late 90s and just trying to find guides of what I should be listening to and what I should be buying. And, right. You know, to buy a bluegrass CD in London in the UK in the 90s, you'd have to buy an imported version <laughs> of something that cost you an arm and a leg. You'd never heard it. You right. didn't know if you were going to like it. You didn't know, you know. And it's like it was a right. big risk to fork out that amount and now you can turn your phone on and go like flat and scruggs okay let's have a look and it, it just it makes stuff accessible but i think there's also that thing of learning an instrument you don't have to keep putting the needle down again and again to work out what somebody's doing stuff's on youtube stuff's or you can go to a site like artist works and learn from oh brian totally. sutton or tony trishka or mike marshall or totally. you know the people totally. who are in the thick of it yeah and so i act and, and on top of that the technology of just instrument making you know obviously there's a huge love for vintage instruments but the basic level of affordable new instruments now is so much better yeah. than it was when i was a kid you know you, you can yeah. learn to play guitar without physically injuring you you know growing up in the um growing up in the you know or the that the late 70s early 80s period for myself you know i graduated high school in 84 um, and yeah, it was, it really was just a matter of dropping the needle and trying to capture what they're doing, which I think in one way, because it was not visual, hmm. I think in a, in an auditory sense, you had to learn, it, it developed your ear in a particular way of listening because you couldn't see what they were doing, but you could hear it. So you had to learn through just hearing how, how are they getting that chord or how are they doing that phrase or whatnot. Um, and today, you know, because of, 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 of YouTube and others, you know, or Audis works, or even early on, there we go in the eighties, uh, the early homespun tapes video, yeah, yeah. you know, um, you know, you could now order a VHS tape, put that in and, and, and now you can see how they're doing that. Um, in my day and time early on, that was just non-existent. And so I think younger players being able to see, or pe anybody really though, being able to watch how it's actually done and played and just the, the sheer number, the technology is really great. Um, and of course being at my age, I will say, yeah, it's kind of cool just to put a record on and learn that way. Just learn by listening, you know, yeah, there's yeah. something to that as well. But yeah, and with instruments too, in my day, I sound like I'm not that old, but yeah. <laughs> in, in, the, in the early 80s, you know, I was a kid, I was the kid that was bringing the Fretz magazine. Uh, I guess you guys had that over there in your kid. Fretz and then Pickin magazine. I was bringing those to, you know, to school. And really, you know, you, you had Martin, uh, but also you had um, you had Gallagher, and then you had um, Mossman. That was a big, you know, Stuart mm -hmm. Mossman guitars. And and yeah, you had some others that were making guitars. But again, you know, unless they advertised in one of those trade publications, you, you didn't know. You, you just didn't know about them. And today, man, there's just so many great makers. Whether it's whether it's a uh, a, a large entity like, like a Martin 
um, or still a good a good size hands on shop like Collins. You know, I play Collins guitars. Yeah, um, and I've been to that shop. You know, it's bigger than you think, but it's still very hands on. On down to the guy who's maybe making ten instruments a year in his basement. You know, and the, and for luthiers, just the knowledge to be shared. You know, they can mm. call up a TJ. They can call up a TJ Thompson or a Mark Stutman um, or a Dave Musselwhite and say, "How do I do this?" You know, um, and that community is very sharing, very giving. So it seems like the bar is raised overall, whether it's musicianship, the the material, the influences, or for, you know, for builders as well. You know, and uh, you know, for this project, we kind of wanted to keep. In the vintage, in the vintage world, you know, I used a Colleen CJ forty five, but uh, man, it was kind of fun also watching everybody bring in their old pieces of wood, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, so that was fun to make an album that was because Norman has just been, you know, Norman Blake and vintage guitars are synonymous with each other, you know. So yeah, and uh, everybody brought their good stuff. So yeah, <laughs> and did George Green have a sort of a hand in that as well in terms of which instruments were you know was he was he available to advise and have opinions because I imagine he's he'd be fascinated to see what was coming in and out of those rooms. Well, you know, um, like Tim Stafford, he brought his thirty four D eighteen. Kenny Smith brought his thirty five uh, D eighteen. You know, I've got Frankie my thirty six D eighteen. Critter brought us 37. <laughs> so, you know, and everybody else brought what they brought. Um, George, for, I, and I don't know why, but he really gave me kind of carte blanche with, with instruments. Um, he, he told me, he says, he says, you, you can use anything I have in, in, the, in the collection, you know, and I'm like, wow, okay. For sure. Yeah. And so, I had cut some stuff with uh, certain guitars, but listening back, they maybe didn't appeal on, on track as much after I listened to them. So I went back, I did two overdubs. I went back in and I used, um, I used a 31 L two from George. Um, and then I used a, I think it was a 37 or 38, uh, advanced jumbo Gibson advanced jumbo, you know, other than that, uh, okay. I had the CJ 45 from Collins. Other than that, it's, it's Frankie, my D 18, which is kind of like, that was always the bucket list guitar. And again, you know, because of Norman Blake, his whiskey before breakfast album on the, on the cover of the album, that's a 36 D 18, but on the record, it's a 34 D 18 bar fret. And so, you know, I guess that's, I always kind of make the joke when I played that, when I bought that record and started playing it, I was wondering why doesn't my cheap Bentley guitar <laughs> sound like that? <laughs> you know? And I say, it just took me 40 something years to, uh, to get the right guitar, you know? So, yeah, but everybody brought really great instruments. And I think that added to the sonic quality. Uh, you know, you can listen to this project and really hear the wood, mm -hmm. um, and the expression of those vintage instruments, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. And the sort of duo setting really lets that, um, lets that breathe and lets that live and you can, you can hear everything. I love hearing, you know, sure. acoustic duo records because it's just, you get, you hear more of the instruments and you also, you, there's a sense of conversation going on as well. Um, and there's something sure. very intimate and just really appealing about that. Yeah. And that's some of my favorite records, you know, whether it's the Blake or Rice albums, those are really great. Um, Tony's Church Street Blues album is will always be timeless. The tone will always be something people are trying to capture. And in the modern world, um, all the stuff uh, that Julian Lodge and Chris Eldridge have done, I love yeah, those. Yeah, I love those. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, that's great. Um, in, even though it's not bluegrass or anything. One of my favorite records, and I would say it's one of my favorite records ever, and it probably will be 20 years from now if I live that long, is Julian Lodge's World's Fair album. 
because yeah, when you yeah. put headphones on, when you put headphones on and play that, the sound of that guitar and the way it's recorded, you know, and and I think also that maybe hopefully was part of the appeal I was trying to convey with this record. There's enough there's enough records out there with bands and a lot of music, a lot of sound, a lot of things going on. And those are great, and they have their place as well, because that's what music is all about. But it's nice to contribute an album like this, where, like you said, it's just it's kind of conversational. It's a little mm. slower. It's a little slower pace, um, a little bit more living room, if you want to put it like that, like we sound like we're in the living room. And, and I hope this is a record that people enjoy. They can put it on. And uh, and hopefully not hard to listen to, you know. And yet, by not being hard to listen to, it translates in a way where uh, they can garner a lot from it. Yeah, so I'm I'm really proud of it. Yeah, and you should be. It feels it feels sort of um, it feels timeless already. You know, it's got a there's yeah. just a depth to the songs and the performances, and there's just it feels. And maybe I'm maybe I'm biased by knowing the story behind it before i heard it but it just feels like there's a lot of <laughs> yeah. love in it you know it feels like a an album full of love and respect and yeah. like joy you know yeah um i think so you know i think that was the thing that everybody um brought intrinsically to the project um norman turns 84 on march 10th which is when the record actually releases you know, um, the full record, you know, right now when we're talking, it's available for pre-order and the first single Jensen Sullivan just came out a couple of days ago, but, um, yeah, you know, he turns 84 years old and, and still plays, you know, he's, and I, and I don't think he would be offended me saying this, uh, because and this is something that technology has brought too. you know, when, when we punch in Tony Rice or Norman Blake or, or anybody that we love musically into YouTube for videos, we have a mindset that they're always that age, Yeah, you know? Yeah. It's kind of a weird thing. You know, you, and I guess that part of that is too with what gets lodged into your psyche when you're younger musically, you know, you always remember them when you hear them at that age and all the experiences around you being a certain age when you first heard them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's, he's turning 84. He, he's not the fiery picking Norman Blake from whiskey before breakfast or, the Blake and Rice, he's not that, but he is this richer, deeper, um, musician, you know, mm. and I've sat there and, and, you know, fortunate enough to sit with him and play or just sit there. i tell you what, the first time I went down, I really wasn't worried about playing with, with with him it was more about visiting it was more about meeting him getting to to visit with him and nancy and then playing the music playing the record for him mm. but afterwards he took me upstairs and we played some but we end that's my dogs uh but we ended up playing banjo no guitar no man no nothing just banjo and he has this uh, great collection of old uh banjos from open back banjos uh, various, you know, various brands uh, from, you know, the 1910s through 1920s. Has them strung with nylon strings because that's what he prefers. And, you know, I, I, I was playing some banjo with him. And I just got to the point where I quit playing and just watched his right hand because he still has that right hand. You know, it's like, you know, I want that right hand, you know, if I can, if I can get that right, you know, um, and so I think as musicians age, one of the values that I, I gained from, from this experience with him is that in a world 
where everybody is so consumed with maybe playing fast, you know, mm. or, you know, putting on the metronome at 150 beats and, you know, doing what they do for a minute for, for an Instagram video or whatever. I think the one thing I take away, which is nothing wrong with that. If you can do it, great. But there's going to be a point in your life that those skills are going to go just because of age, you know, um, you're going to lose those things. And what I've kind of learned a little from Norman is it's okay to get old. It's okay to be an old guitar player and it's okay to change and morph and develop your skills to fit your age. Um, and I think if you have a focus as a player to develop those things early on, whether that's in your, you know, your late twenties or your thirties or forties or fifties or whatever, to develop a certain toolbox of skills and musical sensibility hmm. that when those, when those things do start to fade and your hands don't work like they used to, and you, just by necessity, you have to change. If you've developed those things and have that musical depth, then whatever you do age appropriately, it's still going to be you. It's still going to be great. And I think at the end of the day, you're being honest with yourself. You know, mm. Tony, unfortunately, Tony didn't live long enough. Uh, and I think because of his, you know, his hands and his arthritis and stuff. Um, he just kind of quit playing, you know, he just didn't do that for the longest time. Uh, and I think I respect that because from maybe from Tony's perspective, um, he just decided to go out on top. I'm not going to give people subpar for performances. Consequently, Norman Blake is still making records. I mean, last time I was down there talking to him, he's talking about making another record. Hmm. You know, Day by Day just came out last year. Yeah. He's talking about making another record. So he's not letting his age or the way he plays slow him down. And I think, I think if you can look past the plane, which is still great, but if you can look past that and look at, how he got there and what he's doing and how he's doing it. That's something as a musician you can take with you and build on, you know, for your whole life, you know? And, uh, so I think I've learned a lot more about other things other than playing music through this whole experience with making this record. It's, it's kind of changed my, it's kind of changed certain things in my life and my perspective, you know? Uh, yeah, that it's okay to get old. It's okay not to be able to play certain things the way you used to. It's going to happen eventually anyway, you know, embrace those changes as a musician. And, uh, you know, and I, I maybe that's why older musicians, they always, I, I grew up listening to older musicians say, well, it's about tone. It's about your tone. It's about the taste, you know, the space between the notes. And I think now I kind of get that, you know, mm -hmm. more than ever, because it is about pulling tone and it is about note choice. It is about creating space in the music, which are exactly the things maybe as a younger player, you're kind of like, man, how are they doing that? You know, th that's the thing you like about certain music. Well, the reason you like it is because the people that are doing it are old enough to realize that's the perspective. That's what really matters. So, yeah, just that's some rambling, but I think that's kind of where I'm getting to. Yeah, and I think it's, I think that's 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 true of life, isn't it? It's um, you, you've got music is communication. Like if you're playing music mm -hmm. for real, right. you are trying to communicate something of what it is to be you to other people and form some kind of connection and so you've got to have something to say and maybe maybe when you're younger you have a bit less to say and a bit more invested in how you say it and as you get older you invest a bit more in what it is you're saying and that's sort of true through life isn't it you get to know yourself some people like come out 21 years old know exactly <laughs> who they are whether you know miles davis left left oh. space from day left space from day one but that's you know yeah. you, you, you learn yourself as a human yeah. 
and as well as you uh, sort of in parallel with learning who you are as a musician they're not they're not separate things are they i don't think they are um and i think i think as you get older um you know i've got two ginger and i have two grandchildren now five years old and one that just turned one and um and that's a perspective change, you know. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, I'll play guitar around the house or whatnot when they're here. Uh, it's kind of funny. I I did the Grand Ole Opry with uh, Wendy Moten, who's a great singer, great, just a great singer. Uh, I did that with her a couple nights ago, and I was playing the video. We have a large TV, and I was casting it from my phone to the TV. And my five-year-old grandson... That was his first thing of like what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. You know, he saw he saw Papa up on the screen, you know, playing guitar as opposed to playing in the house. And so my perspective isn't really I mean, my perspective is like investing the music into them now. You know, and I hope with the vinyl my vinyl collection and and my CDs and all the instruments it's like I want to take this music and, and pass it on to them. And so that's where I'm investing, you know. Hmm. And you slow down, you know. I will say this for traveling, you know. I, as a traveling musician, traveling gets tough as you get older, you know, packing a bag and fighting at an airport and getting to the hotel and all that. Um, especially if you go overseas, you know. A few years ago, we did, uh, we did uh, England, uh, Scotland, and Ireland. And we've been to Australia, you know, it takes forever to get to Australia. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's a lot of time in the air, you know, and you're not going for just one day. You're like there for two weeks, you know. And so, um, but the older you get, the travel gets tougher. Um, and the shows become the easy part. It's all the other stuff. So when yeah. I come home, when I come home, it's, you know, it's pick up an old guitar and play stuff that I really enjoy playing, visit with the grandkids. Um, and yeah, you know that you, your perspective changes as you get older. And I think that that's with everybody. And when my time comes to not make a living playing music anymore, you know, it's like, I always want to play music, but I'd like to get into something like, I know it sounds crazy, but like, you know, learning how to do, you know, make, you know, Japanese woodworking with cutting Japanese wood joints, you know, or something in a shop like that, you know? Um, yeah, I think your, 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 your focus changes. And then uh, with, with learning how to play age appropriate, that's, I don't know why I keep saying that, but that's really just kind of become a thing with Mm -hmm. me. It's like, just be happy. I think the technology age has put us in a position where, Maybe we think we have to perform too much for our peers, you know, uh, and yeah. we're, maybe we're, maybe sometimes we, we do things on, on video with our playing, um, for the wrong reasons. Maybe is that a weird perspective? You know, no, maybe t- we're uh, trying my- to impress. Yeah, go ahead. One of the, one of the first interviews I did for this podcast, I think the first interview was Jake Eddy, who plays with Becky Buller's band. And he yeah. was saying that that sort of, you know, 180 BPM for Instagram, he's saying that's just marketing. You're just sort of showing people you can do it. He said, like, he yeah. said you know, come to, come to one of my shows. I'm not going above 120. And we're um, often playing slower than that. He said it's, it's sort of part <laughs> of marketing yourself as a, as a thing online. He said it's not real. You know, yeah. and it's, exci- you know. it's exciting to listen to, but I get as much joy out of listening to Eric Sky give a tune, a huge amount of air and oh. breath. And, you know, that there's, there's infinitely as much, if not more to be enjoyed about that. Man, Eric's, I mean, I've known Eric for years. And when I go up to his neck of the woods, we always hook up and play. And man, I always learn something from him. I mean, that the space and tone that he pulls and his interpretation. I mean, yeah, you can, you can get a lot from that. And you know, every yeah, the marketing aspect of it, yeah. Um maybe I see that, you know. Um I don't know, it's just, you know, 
I think learning learning to put different tools in the toolbox. So when you're if you do live to be eighty four like Norman Blake, you still yeah. have something really kind of profound to say, you know. But uh, you know, in the end, you know this uh, this album has just been a it's been a pleasure to make, uh, and it's really changed my way of thinking with a lot of things, not only with life in general, but also with how to make a record, um, how to listen to people play. You know, when you sit in when you sit in a room with any of these folks here, you know, you just you kind of have to go. My, I wanted to go in as part producer, part student, because I knew I would learn something from the way they did things. Um, so yeah, you know, so this record, it's been a pleasure to make and, um, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really do. And I hope everybody else really, uh, really takes a listen to it. And, uh, I hope it finds a place on their, uh, on their repeated playlist. How, how's that? Yeah. So, it's, I, yeah. I mean, I've, I'm enjoying it already and I can imagine that's only going to deepen the more I listen to it. Um, so thank you for making it. And thanks for taking the time out to come and chat to me. It's been a real pleasure. Well, Matt, I, I, again, you know, uh, your podcast is is one of the great ones out there. And you're helping so many players um, in so many different ways. And I appreciate you having me and letting me ramble in my right. typical mid-Tennessee way. And uh, I appreciate your time. And uh, I look, for, I look forward to, to more of your podcasts down the line, my friend. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun to record. Um, I will stick some info in the show notes so you can see where you need to go to find out more about the record uh, and to order a copy for yourself, which I highly recommend you do. Um, Thanks again to Bob. That was great. I will see you all next time. Happy picking.